Hearts and Minds will be interviewing all the Euro candidates in the run up to the 4th of June. The Green Party's Stephen Agnew is with me now. You're very welcome to the programme. Thank you. Mark. Glad the Greens to be have here. had some electoral success, of course, getting their first uh, MLA in the last elections. But how do you ever hope to bridge that gap between the few thousand votes required for an assembly seat and the tens of thousands mm. you're going to need for Europe? Well, the message we're getting out there is that this is a European election and the Greens are strong in Europe. We actually have 43 MEPs in the European Parliament showing that you know we, we are an effective force across Europe. And, and remember as well that that force is united in ideology. It's not a marriage of convenience like many of the others. So it means we can punch above our weight. So if you elect me, you're electing me to a strong representation and, and a very influential group. But the problem is getting people to vote because people will say, yes, I agree with what the Greens are doing or with some of it anyway. And if I were going to vote, they are who I would vote for. Yes, I mean, that, that has been a problem in our past. Part, part of the reason was we couldn't get our message out there. The opportunities like this are allowing for us to do that. But we have seen with the election of Brown Wilson, the Green Party MLA, and our councillors previous to that, that more and more people are coming out and voting for the Green Party. And in fact, since we've got on to normalised politics here, our votes went up in every election. Mm. One of your party principles is that all political, economic and social decisions should be taken at the lowest effective level. Yet you support the European project, the Lisbon Treaty, which will centralise decision taking in Europe. How do you reconcile those positions? I think it's which decision does it say it's, it's at the lowest effective level. And when we look at issues such as the economic crisis, the energy crisis in terms of where you know we're running out of oil and gas and of course climate change the environmental crisis these need to be tackled they're international issues they need to be tackled at a european level to be effective we can't tackle them on our own here in northern ireland the assembly level we do need to, to so it's to not all decisions you want taken at local level um, no, as I say, the important line is that all decisions at the lowest effective level. So, as I say, if we're talking about international issues, we have international trade now. We need international um, rights protections, you know, international agreements on climate change. They're, they're, they're global issues and, and we need international agreements. And Europe's a strong force in the international field. You're for sustainable uh, economies. Uh, let's look at fisheries, for example. The European fisheries policy is based on uh, making it sustainable, but it's really hurting the fishing fleets in Northern Ireland. So you're not going to have much of a message of comfort for our fishermen, are you? Well, well I, I think, um, and a lot of people are starting to see this now, what we need to tackle in the fishing industry is the issue of discards. And that's been one of those or unintended consequences of legislation that, that we're now having a lot of fish thrown back in. That's what's unsustainable and that's what we need to tackle in terms of the fishing industry. You'd be uh, against or you'd be for reform of the common agricultural policy, which again, farmers won't want to hear from you. Yes, well, I mean, it depends what farmers we're talking about. If the farmers have high animal welfare standards, if they are effectively managing the countryside with environmental responsibility and, you know, protecting our, our environment for, for the future generations of farmers as well as for, for you know, the make sure we have clean, safe food, um, then they've nothing to fear. For those who, who, who maybe are, um, through, through their practices, polluting our rivers or whatever, then maybe they, they, need, they need to see that they need to raise their game. But where we tend to find that is when we get large-scale farming, you know, this industrial-sized farming. You know, we support the small local farmer because that's when you tend to find the, 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 the more sustainable practices. And I think those people, those small farmers with the, 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 the smaller scale, will, will find actually there's a lot that Greens can offer them. You talk about uh, green-collar jobs and you say you could create 33,000 jobs in the creation of renewable energy, for example. 50,000 jobs in uh, green construction if you like. These are hopelessly optimistic targets. Surely. Well, I mean, it, it, it's not us saying that it was the Carbon Trust estimated that in renewable energy alone we could create 33,000 jobs. But let's look at local examples. Look at Harland and Wolf. Last week they announced that they made a profit in the last year. In fact, their profits increased from previous years in the last year. Well, why is that? Well, they were actually in uh, construction renewable energy systems. They, they, business leaders know that this is now the only game in town, moving into this green economy. So there's confidence in this industry when many other industries industries are struggling, the green economy is actually growing. Renewable energy is supposed to account for 20% of the energy we use by 2020 and wind turbines are very big in that and I went mm -hmm. there's a whole argument about whether that's the way to do it or not but you are opposed to nuclear energy 
and most people now seem to be, there's a consensus in the country that we will need something other than renewable energy. So how can you reconcile that? Well, I know there's a debate taking place in Europe, but one thing is for certain. We do not need it here in Northern Ireland. We certainly don't need it on so this So not island. in my backyard. It, it's not a case of not in my backyard. We can power um, our homes on renewable energy. If we, if we, if we invest in wind, solar, uh, tidal turbines, which we've seen at Strangford Lock. We've got a great coastline. We've got the perfect climate for it here. We don't need nuclear energy. There, there very little or no debate on that. And in fact, when one of our members was on a phone-in radio station and um, showed his opposition, he was on against three pro-nuclear people, yet every call came in and said, we don't want nuclear. And um, we agree with the public in this one, and the public's with us. Is there a danger that the Green Party is seen as a one-dimensional body? not um, able to respond to the complex issues of modern government? Well, I think if, if you look at the Green New Deal and look at our manifesto, which we launched this week, the idea of the Green New Deal is that we tackle the environmental, the social and the economic issues together. I, I think that's where we're ahead of the game with other parties. All the environmental policies are going out the window now because there's an economic crisis. But if you want policies that are sustainable, you need to take all three together um, and create jobs whilst moving us towards a low-carbon lifestyle. And as well as that, we can actually help tackle things like fuel poverty by creating our own energy here in Northern Ireland and stop the price rises that we've seen over the winter. All right, Steve McNew, thank you very much. Thank indeed. you.